Hello everyone and welcome to Manif 2015's Inside the Filmmaker Studio. Our guest this morning is a sensational documentary filmmaker who founded the History Boutique. A former employee of a sister company of PBS, as an oral historian, Erin Durham's keen eye for a story has made her a much talked about real story director in the US. And the UK premiere of a much anticipated Busking Blues will be shown at Manif 2015 later this evening. Her latest title, The Julian Price Project, is currently in production. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Erin Durham. Thank you and welcome to the Filmmaker Studio. Now, this showcase has been designed to delve into the perils and lessons to learn of all that is independent film. But before that, let's start at the beginning. Erin, where were you born? I was born in Waco, Texas, which has you know, a weird, creepy, scary story to it, but I was only there for like six months and spent the rest of my childhood in Memphis, Tennessee, and um, Charlotte, North Carolina. Brilliant, and where is it you went to school? Um, oh, a strange high school <laughs> called Butler High with another girl in the audience, um, yeah. And was it at school that your interest in film began, or? Yeah, actually, it was. Um, I had a, I had a theater teacher in middle school that kind of forced me to act for the first time. She knew I wanted to, but I was embarrassed and I didn't know how to do it in front of all my friends in the room. So she made all my friends leave, and then had me uh, stand up and do a monologue from Macbeth, and it was like the best experience of my life because I had secretly wanted to act since I was a really little kid. I would watch commercials and write down, you know, what the script was and then practice it in the mirror. And I did that from when I was really young and didn't tell anybody. And somehow this acting coach knew that I was like desperate to want to do it. And then from then on, I was acting. That was acting. So how is it you made the way to documentary filmmaking, if you don't mind me asking? Um, well, I was going to a lot of auditions and, you know, booking a lot of kind of indie things and commercials, but the indie stuff wouldn't pan out, you know, it wouldn't end up um, either being completed or being distributed, and the commercials were, you know, Subway and Sprint and things that, you know, aren't that difficult to do acting-wise. Um, so I just didn't feel very fulfilled. Um, acting's amazing, but it, when you're not working on something that's epic, it's really hard to cling to it. And um, so I went to grad school for history, because I love history, and I got an internship with PBS. And I just clicked with all the guys in the control room, so they just started showing me everything, and you know, showing me um, how to work the cameras, and lighting, and audio, and how to tech direct, and how to floor direct, and just everything having to do with live broadcast. So, um, that got me really interested in the techie side of things, and I already loved to edit and just kind of work with computers, so um, it was a natural fit, I think, to go to that side as R well. Right, okay, so when you see a story that you think, wow, that would make a great documentary, could you just quickly walk us through your process? Ugh. Um, I see stories all the time that I want to turn into films, especially from the oral historian side of things, there, there's this sense of urgency because you're usually capturing somebody's story who's going to pass away soon, or, you know, people who survived the Holocaust, people who, who you know, fought in world wars. That you're just desperate to get their story before it's gone. Mm. Um, so usually, what I do is I kind of gauge the sense of urgency <laughs> first and foremost, and. And sometimes, like with the busking film, it was, you know, I really want to do this. Nobody's done it yet. And, um, you know, it's just, it's a mix between the sense of urgency and uh, whether the story's been told at all. And with buskers, they're really, really hard to um, really get to know because they're entertainers, but they're also very, very guarded. Yeah. So I knew I wanted to to know kind of what their lifestyle was like, but it took me being with them for a few months and trying to get in for a few months until I realized that this is a real story that um, Buskin Blues is just the, kind of the beginning of that story. After they saw the movie, I think they realized they could trust me 
that I stuck with the rules that, you know, I promised them I wouldn't do certain things or talk about certain things. So now I feel like I could do it all over again and get even deeper because they trust me now. But so, so Buskin Blues 2 then? Yeah, maybe <laughs> international, maybe the international version. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what would you say? I think you, I think you touched on it there briefly with sort of that sense of urgency, you know, when you need to tell that story mm. soon or, you know, you feel it's an important story that needs telling. What's the most important thing in a story for you? Um, just authenticity. Right. I mean, there are tons of famous people and tons of wealthy people that want their story told, but that's not usually the stories I go after. Um, I say that, but the Julian Price documentary I'm doing is about a very, very wealthy man, um, but his story is very, very unique. He gave um, millions of dollars, almost his entire inheritance, to building up this random city, the city I live in now, Asheville. Um, but he did it to help create a better environment for the people that lived there. So, and he believed in the arts. He built a theater. He, you know, did a, a giant music venue. He did a paper, an international bookstore with international press. And um, he just made sure that the livability of this town of, you know, mountain people <laughs> was, was um, felt very European. Yeah. And that's unique. And he didn't ask for any kind of, um, you know, he didn't, he didn't get a statue. He didn't get anything. He didn't even want his name in the paper when he did stuff like that. And sometimes it was, you know, millions of dollars. But I don't know. That's usually I just go for somebody who, who has a really authentic story or a story that um, is inspiring. That's a huge part is inspiring um, stories that wouldn't otherwise be told but that could change people's lives. That sounds absolutely fascinating. I mean, I've ne never even heard of the man. I mean, like, but it's one Nobody of those has. things. No, it sounds, it sounds absolutely incredible. Yeah. Uh, I know we said you're in production with that. How far along are you? We're in post. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. We did 33 oral histories and a couple weeks of B roll. And yeah, I mean, just in post, we're working with uh, a really well known. Um, called recording studio echo mountain recording studio who's already doing this compilation album of uh local bands with this amazing symphony backing them so they've partnered with my new film and we're doing this like epic soundtrack below his story so which he would have loved because he was you know obsessed about the arts but i don't know i'm excited so i have to wait for that to finish being mixed and then i can finish the edit that sounds incredible. I can't wait to see it. Um, yeah. I, think, I think it's pretty, it'll be pretty obvious, this one, but is there anything, you know, when you see a story that you think, no, that isn't for me, that I don't want to make that film, I don't want to tell that story? When it's clearly propaganda, I get that a lot. Hmm. A lot of news stations all over the world are hiring documentary filmmakers to make their BS look authentic, and I've been asked to do it a couple times now, and it usually takes me a little while to figure it out, but then I'm like, that's not, nope. Like, <laughs> I don't believe in anything you're, you know, you're preaching, and they're gonna also micromanage my edit and make sure that I spin it in a certain way, and I never wanna do anything like that. I'm fine with working with other people, but they have to have a, a genuine goal of telling the true story. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you mentioned the authenticity. You know, you spoke about the buskers when Buskin Blues, and they were very happy with how you portrayed them. I think you were very fair in Buskin Blues. I absolutely loved it. I thought, <laughs> it, was, thought it was a really good film. You should all go see it. It's on tonight. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I thought it was absolutely incredible. Like that, how important really is that authenticity? Do you just have to capture that? Have you ever started a project and just halfway through thought, I'm not getting to the meat of this story? Yeah, I started the Julian Price film with that, like because people were nervous about what to say and how to portray him because he wasn't this, you know, bubbly, happy guy. He had, just like everybody, he had kind of this dark, sad side. This, you know, struggled with depression, like most, I think, most of the world has at one point. So um, I could tell, especially the older generation was like, you know, stunted in what they were trying to say to me. And once I kind of got past, look, I already know that Sometimes this guy was sad, and, mm. and he felt a lot of remorse for having, and guilt for having this amount of money when the person next to him didn't. So, you know, once we got past that, it was pretty easy. 
And the buskers were the same way. They would, um, just like anybody you interview, they try and impress you with a bunch of frill. I've done this and I've done this. And once you tell them, like, you know, I just want to know, like, the, you know, like what you eat for breakfast, how you get to the street, what you do, you know, that kind of stuff, they calm down. Like, once they realize you're genuinely interested in what they're doing, yeah. the, the thing they do every day that, you know, they might have some shame attached to, like most people do. They're not where they want to be, so, you know, they're embarrassed to talk about it. But once you get past that and they realize that you're, you don't think it's shameful and you think it's awesome, yeah. then they open up. I think it's that simple. I've, I've interviewed people myself when they've feared that you are, you're there to stitch them up or you just want the truth. Yeah. You mentioned it took months sort of to get through to yeah. these, uh, these buskers. Was that a difficult process? Were there any yes. who just would not involve themselves yes. with you? Still. Oh, really? Still. Still even now? Yeah. There's a <laughs> um, there were a couple that... <laughs> Oh, God. Well, first of all, it took months for any of them to even respond to me, like through Facebook or any of social media that I could find them on or talking to them. I'd drop business cards in their, in their um, uh, guitars and no response. And at one point, I saw one just flick it out. And I was like, OK. Um, <laughs> but I ran into one, one of the kindest, Peter Levitoff, um, at a party. And I just went up to him afterwards. I was like, you're one of my favorite musicians. You're amazing. And told him that my project idea. So him and his roommate, who was another busker in the film, the violin player, Mark, they met me for tea. And we talked for hours. And then they got somebody else to talk to me, Abby the Spoon Lady. And then she is, you know, in a lot of ways, the matriarch of that area. So she was like, you're going to talk to Aaron today. Make sure you get up and make sure you're on time. And don't make her wait. Like, and I'm like, you're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> but there are a couple, um, and I asked them after I filmed, they let me film them play, yes. but not interview. There are quite a few, but um, I asked a, a band that I had, you know, become friendly with. They were really nice. And I asked them afterwards, hey, you know, why don't you, you know, do you not trust me? Or what, you know, what is it? And they were like, we don't want, you know, the, the mystery of busking to go away and we're worried oh, wow. your film is going to show, you know, kind of a misrepresentation of how much money we make and, um, and kind of people, they think that the reason people love busking is there's this mystery behind who the people are and where they live and what they do and they didn't want that to go away. And I completely agreed with them. I don't want that to go away. And it doesn't. Like, I, I was, I've been with them for the past two years and I still have a ton of questions. And they're not going to answer them all. Like they're, you know, it's like they have a little club. Well, they do, and <laughs> and they say, "Don't tell her this. Don't tell her this." But yeah, I, I, don't, know. I don't think the film does remove the mystique. In fact, I think it enhances it because I you hear so. about these like rules that you'd never even considered, like yeah. only two hours, you oh, know, yeah. and not within 50 yards of another yeah. busker and all that. Right. So and that we, leads to fights. I, not not in Asheville, but in most cities. It's a very aggressive environment, which is why a lot of buskers, even international buskers, come to Asheville because it's usually very um, welcoming yeah. to outsiders. And a lot of local buskers will, will get up to let them perform if they're good. If they're not good, they're like, get out of our city. But, <laughs> but usually the ones traveling from England are good. Jim Bino Vegan, the one in the film. Oh, yes. He's oh, fantastic. God, he's so good. <laughs> He's so good. When, when you finish the film, um, sort of how do you, you know, you're going up for the release, do you feel any you know, anticipation, nervous, excited for sort of how the audience is going to react to that? Yeah. Well, we were talking about this last night, Tori and I. It's like you, you I don't know. You, well, I edited my film, so I got a little crazy towards the you know, end, and I was like, I don't even know what this looks like. And you know, I went out and got more B-roll, and we shot for three months, and then I went out. <laughs> a month later and shot for another four nights. But I just didn't feel like I had enough and, and buskers come in so frequently. So I'll be, you know, like I got back from K film in Grand Cayman last week and I came back to Asheville and there were all these new buskers. And I was like, ah, I need you to be in the film. You're really good. Um, but it's too late. So that, I think that's the hard thing, especially with documentaries is with something that's a current event, it's never going to be told, you know, 
the at the level it should be told, especially when it's a year old. You mm. know, I shot it last summer, so um, it's hard. It's definitely hard to look at it. I don't know. So I had different days. Some days I'm like, oh, and I try and focus on like these are my friends now. This is like you know these people I really care about and. They're really, really good people. They play with my kids. They're they're sweet, you know. So I try and just focus on their faces and um, the music because the music's pretty good. The music is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Is it, so you did briefly again hint on this. You sort of said, you know, you're watching the film and you think, oh, I could have done that. Could have mm. done this. You know, would you ever revisit this project? Yes. Yes. Definitely. Um, and I will. I mean, I purposely made it 60 minutes, so. If PBS picked it up, I could knock off, you know, a few minutes for commercials and it be, you know, yeah. the perfect size for them. Um, but yeah, I, I filmed a, there's been a lot happening with regulation in the past year. And so I've been filming this whole year. So I have all of this footage that could go in and, and keep telling this story of what's happening all over the world right now, which is regulating and almost criminalizing busking. So. Um, our buskers have really, I mean, they've been fighting really, really hard and having these marches through town where they all get together and they all have drums and flutes and it's, it sounds like such a hippie thing and it is, but it's, it's awesome because it's, they're, they're all really, really talented musicians fighting just to play their music. It's like yeah. that simple. Um, so I have that footage, and it'd be really nice to add, maybe add that to the end of them walking through town, you know, with their oh, signs yeah. saying, I heart busking. And it's a lot of people, like tourists joined in and, and started holding drums and playing with them. So, yeah. I, I think you really, really did an extremely good job at just capturing that sense of community, even though, you know, you've got different people and different, uh, you know, talking heads. Essentially, when I was watching it, I was like, you feel that sense of community between all of them. And you've, there's that brilliant bit with the local shop owner, and she said we had um, the violinist outside, and yeah. he brought in business, and, you know, you feel that, oh, these people really like it. But something that I did like, and it's because I just finished my MA in journalism, oh, is yeah. you, um, you brought that sort of, there were a couple of dissenting voices from the mm -hmm. townspeople, and the fact that you gave them a voice in the film, I thought was really, you know, yeah. it was powerful. Do you, how important is it to you to capture both sides sort of, of that you story? You have to. And there were, I definitely didn't want to make a negative film. I like positive, inspirational films. So I, there were some negative things said that I didn't put in the movie. I mean, all the shop owners have something negative to say. Sometimes it makes them look a little ignorant. Mm. So I made sure I didn't put it in because I knew that's not what they meant, but it would be taken that way. And that's... Um, you know, Mary Lou, they all have, and Russell, who's in it. I mean, a lot of the buskers don't like him and are, you know, um, you know, say he's not nice to them. But he was really positive in his interview, and that changed their impression. When they saw that, they were like, we didn't know he thought we were good, you know? And I was like, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I think there's a lot of power in not focusing on the negative. Mm. And, but I got it. I mean, it's there. but. And I put it in when it's valid, like Mary Lou. If you're if you're covering the the um, doors into her store, she's going to lose business. And she's not only a local shop owner, but a local designer, and uses local cotton and local seamstresses. So it's local from the ground up. You want to support her store. So if there's a busker in front of it, that's not really nice. So I put in things that were valid negative concerns that buskers could learn from. Um, which most of them know, but occasionally they're just, you know, they're just having fun and they've got a crowd and they're not thinking about it. Well, I genuinely thought while I'm watching it, it's one of those films, like all good documentaries, you've never really considered this before. <laughs> you know, you see it, you walk past it on the street every yeah. day, you never think about it. And then you're like, oh my God, you know, real story, <laughs> real people. We are now going to delve into our James Lipton style okay. filmmaker studio. So I'm going to begin with, what is your favorite word? Oh, we figured this cozy. Cozy? I love cozy. Cozy. Cozy is a great word. Yeah, yeah. What's your least favorite word? Um, I know this is so generic, but it's really no. No. Yeah, it makes me sad. It's not a good word at it's all, not, is it? It's not a, or pass. That one's almost ruder, because it's like, just say no. Like, you don't need to say pass. <laughs> 
Yes. The, yeah. br the British equivalent is thank you for your interest. <laughs> uh. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, freeze. That's the worst. I write grants, and I get that a lot. We really appreciate you submitting our grant, but maybe but. <laughs> but, yeah. But. That's a bad word. Yeah, thank you for your interest, but at this time, your application <laughs> does not meet our needs. Um, so what is it that turns you on? Um, kindness. Kindness. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. And turns you off? Uh, uh, probably stupidity <laughs> <laughs> or like ignorance, like somebody who like, it's not, it's when it's not your fault, that's a different story. But like, if you're just being stupid, willing, willingly stupid, <laughs> I think is how you define ignorance, isn't it? It just makes me so mad. Yeah. It's like, I don't want to learn about that. Why would I need to? <laughs> what sound or noise do you love? Birds. Birds. Birds chirping. I can be, so, I sound like a Disney character right now, but <laughs> I really love birds chirping. I can be really stressed out or even birds like in a bird bath kind of fluttering around, like any kind of bird sound makes me really happy. And what noise do you hate? Um, probably crying, like animals crying. That's like, you know, sometimes people cry and it's good, but mm. an animal crying, there's like, you gotta like, do something <laughs> scary, yeah. What's your favorite curse word? Ah, um, <laughs> this one I taught my baby, and I didn't mean to. Um, <laughs> uh, it's shit, but there's a there's a different one. Ah, shit. I say that a lot. Ah, shit. And all of a sudden, I heard my little baby girl, like one and a half, go ah, shit. And my dad thought it was the funniest <laughs> thing in the world, and I was like, no. Not. That's brilliant. That confusing moment of that was funny, but at the yeah. same time, oh. Yeah, she doesn't say it anymore, but it was pretty upsetting when it first happened. If you could do any other profession other than your own, what would it be? Um, I want to be Indiana Jones. That's, that's, that's my goal. It's always been my goal, and I feel like I'm working towards it. Um, <laughs> um, I have the Indiana Jones bag. And, you know, I wear my glasses and I get super serious and I do research and I get in the field. But, you know, I've got a few more steps and degrees to get to Indy, so. Before you're a professor of archaeology. And I'm not a professor of archaeology. True. Do you have a bullwhip? I do. <laughs> do you actually? I do. Do you have the Stetson, though? No. It's, it's not, I mean, is it, it a Stetson? It, it's some kind of amazing hat, but it's, I have a cheap version. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Halloween every year? Yeah, one, well, one year, but. I don't know. The girl versions are just like little slutty outfits, and I don't want. I want to. I want to be Indiana Jones. I've never got that. that yeah. Whole, like bear your midriff. Um, if there's, sexy kitten. Oh you know, god. <laughs> I've never. You know, the worst one I ever saw was sexy pumpkin. Like, oh. What's going on there? Sexy schoolgirl or 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 sexy Girl Scout. Like what? It's upsetting. It, it is. So any profession that you would not want to attempt under any circumstance besides Halloween costume designer, clearly. I know, man, that's a good one. Um, we are thinking about this this morning, probably like working for TSA, because it, they just look really, or do you guys have that here? It's like the, the uh, security people in the airport. They're the scary people in American airports who say stand behind the yellow line. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we raise your arms, get in the thing, you know. They're, oh, I've never had a bad experience with them. They're always really, really nice to me, but it just seems like one of the most stressful jobs on the planet. And it's monotonous at the same time. It's not like you're in a plane, like, you know, protecting something. It's like you, you have to do the same thing over and over again. And it could be like a sweet mom, and then it could be a terrorist. Mm. And it's like, it's your job to figure that out. That's too much pressure. Too much pressure. Here's an idea for a documentary, TSA <laughs> Blues. There you you go. know what? That's a really good idea, actually. It probably wouldn't be allowed to do it, but probably not. No. I know. Executive producer credit, though, if okay. you do do Done. it. <laughs> Done. Finally, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Um, probably like they're all here or something like that. Like I would want all my animals that have passed away, my friends and family, and like a bunch of rock stars I love. To just be like, Aaron, I love you. Come on, let's go do stuff. Puppy party. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's genuinely my favorite answer we've had so yes! far. Yeah. Winning. Sorry, Tora. Um, <laughs> okay, we're now going to open it up to the audience. So if there's any questions, you can raise your hand now. Except for Andrea. Any questions? questions. Any at all? Oh, 
Sorry, can't see with these stage lights. Oh, yeah, it's frightening, isn't it? Um, yeah, the, the sort of the boring part of it about funding and stuff. Because yeah. we're sort of all filmmakers and we want to tell stories. And the, yeah. the sort of the major stumbling block is always money. Yeah. So I was just wondering how you sort of go about that sort of thing. Um, the biggest thing I've found, everybody wants to be a filmmaker. Most people who, you know, they, I hear it all the time. I have a really good idea. And... I, I felt exactly the same way with Buskin Blues. I had a really good idea, so I did what I knew as a historian, go get grants. So I applied to a bunch of grants. Um, I'd never made a film independent of PBS before, so nobody was gonna give me money. So I decided to fund this one myself with the rule that this is the only one I'll ever fund. And the budget, you know, kept the budget really, really low. Um, since then, uh, I've been lucky enough to get on a bunch of projects. People have hired me to direct their projects, and you just choose the ones that you think are authentic and, and worth telling. Um, the projects I've got coming up, I'm doing a lot of the stuff that Gareth suggested, um, similar things. I'll go to uh, people or businesses that would be interested in this kind of story and see if they want to sign on, that kind of thing, other production companies. Once you have a couple films under your belt that have done well in the festival circuit and you've got a name for yourself and you know education, people start to sign on. That You might not get a million dollars, but you'll get 30, 40 grand pretty easily. So, and I think documentaries, they don't, especially oral histories, they don't need to be very expensive. You can still pay crew their full day rate, but only have three to four crew, because you shouldn't have more than that in a room when you're interviewing somebody about something serious, you know? So, um, and I usually keep probably 70%, 60, 70% of my budget for post, mainly because I'm in post, so I know how hard post is, and you have to hire a colorist and all this stuff I didn't know about uh, two years ago when I made Buskin Blues, I was like, what? And I was like, I knew we shot flat, but I just thought you hit a button and it was like colored or something, I didn't know. So that's a thing, and scoring a film and all this stuff that's uh, really expensive, and if you don't do it well, like um, my friend Ben Lovett told me, your, your project is only as good as your weakest link. So, and especially if your weakest link is music, and that's a lot of times how people follow a story, that's not good. So, um, so yeah, funding in, in this year since the busking film has come to me, but the projects that I've got in my head that I'm wanting to start, we're kind of partnering with um, larger music companies because I've got two music documentaries starting in two months. So those will be uh, much bigger projects that I don't have to find funding for. Any more questions? I think there's one at the back. Uh, you mentioned the word kindness mm -hmm. earlier, and I, I unfortunately, sadly, haven't seen any of your documentaries, but I get the feeling <laughs> that you, kindness is quite an important issue in, wh in what you do. Yeah. Uh, can you ever see yourself doing what I call hard-bitten uh, documentaries, where you're fairly, you, know, you have to be fairly ruthless and, and, and uh, attack people? I mean, yeah. is, is that in you at all, do you think, or not? Definitely. I, um, I, was, I just stopped a project where I was willing to do that, and then I was told I wasn't allowed to do that, that I had to just get the answers, the fluffy answers <laughs> that were given to me. And I was like, but this guy is not for real. So I would definitely do kind of a heavy-hitting documentary, especially one that in the end could be seen as inspirational, you know? Um, because you know, my, most of the research I did in undergrad and graduate school was environmental and um, animal preservation. So it was, I definitely want to get into kind of opening up subjects that people don't really know about. Um, I would love to do that. I'm hoping to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Any more? Ah, uh, Andrea. <laughs> 
can ask to fix my hair. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, were the bus any of the buskers concerned about publicity or how um, not just how you portray them, but how other people would portray them after seeing the film and interest in their music? Like, is that something they were? interested in like having people yeah. hear their music or was that something that maybe like concerned them because of the mystery aspect some it's weird i mean buskers are so different it's just like just like musicians in a venue some are there and they are very complacent with where they're at and they love what they do they love performing on the street and they don't want to do anything else and and those are the people that for the most part want to keep that mystique they want to keep it like it is they don't want anything to change and there are some buskers that they are fighting for fame and 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 a real career. They're they're they don't want to um, what do they say, hand to mouth. Like they don't want to like, you know, be poor and worry about rent and all this stuff. They want to make money and get their music out there. Um, and for those people, and there are quite a few of those. I mean, a, a lot of really famous musicians started out busking. Um, Glenn Hansard, I guess, is like the most famous one, but B.B. King did too, um, and he, he was pretty awesome. Um, he'll be at my puppy party in heaven, so. <laughs> oh, damn. Um, but yeah, I think those, they're really funny because they see me go to festivals and they're like, and you know, the last one I hung out with Virgin, and they were like, oh, did, oh, did you tell Virgin about me? Could you think that, you know, I could get on Virgin Records? And I'm like, well, they saw the film, so they saw you, and they're like, oh, yay, you know? So, like, I, I mean, it's been really positive, and even the ones that were really standoffish to me before, they've seen press, and they've seen all the stuff we've been doing with the film, and they're so positive, and thanking me, even, which is, I was nervous. They were, you know, you never know if people are gonna be like, you know? We don't like, you know, we don't like it. Why aren't we getting to go to these festivals? A couple of them were pretty pissed I was coming to Manchester without them, but only in a jokey way. Any more questions from the audience? Oh, there we go. Straight at the back. Hi, um, I came a little bit late, so I'm not sure if this has been asked already, but as a documentary, how do you approach festivals, like the big ones? Do you, act do you even try to send in? Because I know for mm -hmm. fiction films, they sometimes don't even watch it, right? But as a documentary, like, what festivals are you thinking of? Like, what have you gotten into the... The, um, the festival circuit, this is my first year doing it, and there is a, there's a science to it. I mean, there's the you know, Berlin and Sundance and Cannes and all these like huge ones. Um, and, some, and for the most part, from what I've heard, some of the big ones, unless they have gotten somebody to tell them about your film or something like that, you're not even really noticed. Some screener might watch your film, but maybe not. Um, I've been really lucky. I, I just push nonstop. So I'll email them like 10 times. Anytime I get a new press, something in the press or something, I email everybody I've submitted to. And I'm like, hey, just so you know, we've won this. Or just so you know, we've done this. And um, some festivals always respond and they're really sweet. And others don't. Berlin was amazing. Berl I didn't get into Berlin. And, but they had been talking with me a lot, asking me a lot of questions about the film, so I really thought I was gonna get in. And that would have been my world, my world premiere. And I was so sad when I got the rejection. So I asked them, and this is the only festival I've asked this, but I was like, what can I do different next time? I really just, you know, would love your advice. You can be as brutal. And they were like, nothing, You're, it was perfect. It just doesn't work for our festival. And they explained, in detail, I mean, a really long email about how festivals, you know, they're programming a very specific event and you can't put a bunch of rando films together. It won't work as an event. It's just like planning a party. So um, that made me feel really good getting the massive amount of rejections I got after that. Um, <laughs> but I've gotten into nine as of a couple days ago. So, and that's good. Um, and I think there's something to be said for the smaller festivals or the first time festivals like this one. Um, you just have to gauge, you know, look at all their online stuff and talk to people because a couple of the ones where their online presence was amazing. Um, 
I would go and it was just an online presence. So now I talk to um, kind of my veteran filmmakers that I've become friends with now and, and, and ones I've met at the festivals where they're like, don't apply there. Or, you know, somebody told me Sarasota Film Festival is a really good festival and that's in Florida. And I was like, really? It's Sarasota is like, you know, kind of a retirement place in Florida. But supposedly, they really support the filmmakers. So, um, yeah, I mean, you just, it's just, it's, it's a full-time job, basically, looking for what festivals su to submit to. But what I would suggest is keeping it in your budget to submit to a good amount, because you really have no idea what they have decided their event for this year is going to look like. You know, you have no clue. Um, and sometimes they come to you. Once you've gotten into a couple, I've started getting people asking me to submit, which I don't know if I'll actually get, if that means I get in, but <laughs> um, that's yet to be determined. But I um, hope that helped. Does that help? Yeah, but also, um, what was your budget for submitting to festivals? Did you set yourself like a certain budget and then? I didn't know I was supposed to do that for this, okay. for this project, um, but I would, I don't know. I mean, if you could, I would say like two or three thousand, um, because then you can submit to a good amount and you can budget to go to one that might be really far away, and that could pay for your hotel, that kind of thing. Um, but I mean, it depends on the size of the film, and and if you do early bird submissions versus late submissions, you might pay twenty dollars, you know, twenty U.S. dollars versus eighty. You know, so there's definitely ways to do it. Cool, thanks. Thanks. Okay, any more questions? Any more? I think we're done. No, I think we're done. Right. Thank you very much, Erin. Thank you.